Uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to gather. It feels a little bit strange even to, to be, um, do we have an echo? <laughs> um, to be together again. So I really want to thank you all and um, really appreciate the number of elders that have come out to listen to our presentation tonight and just share a meal and hear about climate change. Um, watching those videos, it really um, brings home to me how old I'm getting. No. <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, videos we talk about climate change and I remember way back when hearing the words but not computing what they meant you know we heard about climate change and we all went yeah 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 that must be somewhere down in the states where it's really hot right and I think back in that time I really did not think we were impacted as heavily as we are and you know 20 years later um, we're living and breathing climate change and we've all seen it one way or another whether it's the heat dome that happened this summer that <clears throat> killed off all the clams on the beaches or the um, dying cedars that we see around the territory you know you can just look anywhere around the community and see the dead tops of the cedar trees uh, the flood we had at the hatchery um, there's a lot of effects that we already see in our community around climate change we were talking about the um, we have what's called the the wheel 13 moons calendar a lot of you have seen the 13 moons calendar and we're already seeing in that calendar where something that was harvested, say, in August is now being harvested in September or October because the, the calendar is changing because it's getting so hot and the weather is changing so dramatically. So these videos, I really um, I'm glad we we're able to watch them because we can see that as a community, we've been talking about climate change long before we knew what the words meant. We've been talking about the impacts of other people on our being. Um, the dam at Theodosia, you know, that happened in the 1950s. Nobody asked us. They just went and dammed the river, right? Um, land that was taken away from us and people that came and settled on our land or moved us off of the mill, T-Squat, and moved us onto this land. So we've been affected by other people for a really long time. And we're getting to the point as a community where it's, you know, it's becoming very serious and it's becoming something that we have to think about um, in our planning and everything we do. I'm in uh, another committee where we talk about flooding, coastal flooding, that's related to climate change as well. Um, and it, it makes us think now if we were going to develop some of these new lands, for example, that are on the coast, we have to think about where we're going to put those houses, right? If we know the coast is vulnerable and it could flood, then now that we have to build further back from the water, we have to build further away from the rivers. <clears throat> we have to think about, you know, having too much bushes around our house or too many trees nearby because if a fire starts it could take out our whole community and we've had that happen here right our whole community burnt down one time so there's a lot to take in around climate change there's a lot to deal with uh, the effect of um, heat and climate change on our fisheries on everything it affects everything we do and you know you heard it in the videos so I just wanted to kind of comment on that a little bit uh, to give you a little bit of background about why we're talking about climate change, because it very much affects our lives and will affect our lives forever now. It's, we can't go back, we can't undo the damage, I think, but we can definitely make better decisions so that we don't make it worse in the future. Uh, we all want our kids and grandkids to be able to go up to Theodosia and catch a fish, right? Dig some roots, maybe camp there in the summer. Um, so um, we have to really think about the future and how we're going to deal with climate change. So um, I also wanted to introduce April. <laughs> uh, most of you know April by now, and April has come on to work with Slyamon. Uh, she's our traditional ecological knowledge coordinator. She's also working with these folks here that um, she'll introduce you to on this new initiative that we want to talk about today, climate change and food security study. Um, food security is another word we've learned recently in the last probably 10 years it's used more and more. Uh, I think we all experienced food insecurity when we went through COVID. You know, all of a sudden people were panicking. They didn't know how they were going to get their food and their flour and their pasta and their fresh vegetables, right? So <clears throat> that really brought it home to me as well that we are insecure when it comes to our food. Um, if the stores didn't have it, what were we going to do, right? If you couldn't get it there, what we were going to do. So <clears throat> I saw a lot of people in the community start 
um, gardens this during this COVID time, and I thought that was pretty cool to see that people were thinking about, you know, I might have to feed myself for a little while here. Um, so I think, you know, security is really important. We need to know that we can always be kaimuch. We can always traditionally practice what we practiced before, you know, that we, we should be able to get fish again. We should always be able to go and do those things that our ancestors did in the past. So <clears throat> that's why we, we get involved in climate change. That's why we, we study it. That's why we make plans for how we're going to deal with it. So that's what April's doing with, with the nation right now. She's been brought on recently to work with us, and I'm very glad to have her. She's an awesome, um, awesome assistant in the work we're doing. And she organized this whole event tonight, so she's been uh, taking the workload off of us. Um, so I don't want to say too much more than that, other than just to say I acknowledge you for being here and thank you. And I do want to keep um, our people in our prayers. You know, we've had a death in our community, uh, and I acknowledge that. And condolences to the family. And we have, you know, we've had people in the hospital as well. So our prayers go out to those people in the hospital as well, and we're thinking about them. And. Uh, I'll babble on all night long, so I'm just going <laughs> to pass you on to April and we'll get down to the business. So thank you all for coming. Cha -cha. So thank you, Denise, for that. She did a very brief overview of everything that's been going on in the last decade or so. And she was very correct in stating that this is not just happening here, it's global. So we can only take care of ourselves in the beginning. And by this project that these guys have introduced to us, it'll help us make a plan so we can take care of our food security. We might have to make mitigations. We might have to, be, might have to do adaptations. There's different things that we have to do, but uh, we do have to take care of ourselves here so then we can show other people how to do it as well. I wanted to start it off by just another video clip. Thank you very much for your patience with all the videos. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes we know what climate change is, but we don't really know what climate change is. So I just wanted to have a little video. It's just a little three minute clip. Is my volume okay on this, Alex? Good question. 600 or thousands of years for the climate change, but recently, our climate has been changing much faster. All these changes make life harder for our plants, animals, and for people around the world. And the biggest cause of climate change is humans, including you and me. When we use fuel and oil and gasoline, when we forests to make room for cities or farms to release greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, these greenhouse gases cause our climate to get warmer. Normally, when the heat from the sun warms our planet, some of the heat reflects back into space. But greenhouse gas acts like a big blanket, holding some of it in. This extra heat can cause all sorts of problems for our planet, and the plants, animals, and people who live here. Our ice and snow are melting faster. Our oceans are getting warmer and higher, and our weather is becoming more extreme with more heat waves, heavy rainfalls, and powerful hurricanes. Luckily, many countries around the world are working together to fight climate change. And there are lots of easy ways you and I can help too, like reusing things instead of throwing them out. Instead of driving, ride your bike or take the bus. Use less electricity and eat food grown closer to home. You and I, we can make a difference. We can fight climate change. How do we get back? Yeah, I got it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I do apologize. I was supposed to introduce my colleagues here. Um, so these guys have been here a couple years ago, 2018, 2019, to do an introduction of the foods, climate change and food insecurity. We have Dr. Lori Chan, who is with the University of Ottawa, and he works with the University of, La or sorry, he has partners with the University of Laval, University of Montreal, University of BC, and Simon Fraser University. 
<clears throat> and then we have Mary, I'm sorry, your last name again? Kappel Hallam. She's with FNHA, Climate Specialist, Climate Change and Health. So she's joining us to represent for one of the partners of FNHA. And then we have Karen Fedewick, who is an independent researcher who has been helping us throughout the years as well. Um, they've been doing the food sovereignty and climate change adaptation research, um, which goes on to the next video. What is climate change, food security, and, and nutrition about? And I swear this will be the last video. Climate change, is, it might seem far away, and probably you can't see or touch or feel every day, but it is happening, and it's global. To get an idea of what's at stake, just look at your plate. Food is profoundly affected by climate change, from how it's produced to what we can grow in the first place. Climate change will hit our food production system in four ways, through temperature, water, extreme weather, and carbon dioxide. Most of us will feel temperature first, so will crops. Productions of staples like corn, soybeans, and cotton are projected to increase at first, then decrease sharply as the average growing season temperature keeps getting warmer. For corn alone, it could mean a decrease of 3% in yield, or more than 300 million bushels. That's enough corn to feed 40 million people. It's not just crops. Livestock will suffer in the heat too. Heat-related stress will mean fewer animal pregnancies, less milk production, and longer times for livestock to reach market weight. Does anyone benefit from the heat? Yes, pests. The ones that live on our livestock. That means more diseases spread by insects. It's already happened in Northern Europe. As the region has warmed, blue tongue virus has moved north, killing more of these animals. Widespread disease could hit crops like corn too. As heat loving earworms spread north to the upper Midwest and heat tolerant viruses like rusts and tobacco mosaic finish off weakened plants. Disease and heat will be even bigger problems as climate change affects water. A dry climate means less production and more pests. Water has a complicated relationship with crops. It's all about the right amount at the right time. Too much early on for a corn stunts growth. Too little later on does the same. Irrigation systems keep the balance, but their sources may dry up as droughts increase. In the Mississippi Delta region, this could put 75% of the rice crop at risk. This rice will also confront another water problem saltier water as sea levels rise. Droughts can be brought on by more erratic rainfall, part of a pattern of increasingly extreme weather events. And when extreme weather brings violent downpours, there's another issue, soil erosion and runoff increase. All these pieces of the climate puzzle, floods, droughts, and heat waves, can affect crops and livestock at key moments in their development, turning even a productive season into a disaster we're already seeing a rise in extreme weather events. 2011 was the most disastrous year on record, with 16 extreme weather incidents at a cost of over $1 billion. 2012 was a close second, and severe storms continue to cost us billions. All of these changes circle back to the key driver of climate change, increased carbon dioxide, which has its own effect on agriculture. Carbon dioxide helps plants grow, or it could actually help crops get bigger. But CO2 helps weeds and invasive species grow even more. Crops that survive the weeds could be compromised with less nutritional value. Wheat, for example, could have protein levels drop by more than 10%. This is complicated business because everything's connected. It all boils down to this. Climate change could leave us with less food, and the food we end up with could be less nutritious. There are steps that can be taken to mitigate and adapt to these changes. They're the key to our food and our future. What will be on your plate? And that's true. Uh, there's 800 billion people in this world that they have to feed in the next 50, 100 years. And with the drought and everything, the food systems aren't going to exceed that. So we have to find a way to bring it home and find a way to adapt. Our people are very resilient and we can adapt, but we have to make the steps to do so, which brings us here today. If you think about climate change and how it's already affected us, this year alone is scary because we had that heat dome in June, I believe it was, and that um, we don't have the sockeye salmon that we used to have. We don't have the, so the any other salmon run as heavy as we did before. Oak Hover Beach was hit very hard this year where all the 
clams and oysters were killed. I believe they said it was 80% were killed that day because it all happened during the day, 12 hours of heat, hot heat, what, 40 degrees, and all of that was during low tide. So it just killed everything as much as it could. So it's really happening here in our backyard. So we need to start doing something today, which brings us to our presentation. And I'm very grateful to these guys deciding to partner with us. I forgot to mention the four nations that are also partnering, partnering with us. I just wanna make sure I say their names right. Uh, Newark First Nation, that's Bella, Bella, Bella Kula. Bella Kula, my apologies. And uh, Namgi's First Nations, which is Alert Bay, and Skidigat Band Council, as well as us. So that's the four nations taking part in this four-year project. And we will hopefully be able to come up with a plan for what we can do for our next steps. For now, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Chan, and he's going to take us on a presentation tonight, which will explain what we've done in the past here more clearly and what we're going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, April. Um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to your beautiful land. Uh, it is uh, uh, really uh, my uh, privilege to come to visit you. Uh, the first time I came here was 13 years ago, long time. Uh, but it seems like tomorrow, uh, yesterday, I still met many good friends and, and old faces and recognize. Uh, so, we, we get older, we have more gray hair, uh, but the environment is more or less the same. So we, we, we but I then I've seen a lot of progress in your community as well. Uh, New Bank Council. Yeah, I will, I will. Uh, so it's wonderful. Uh, I wish I could come up more often and, and, and meet to, and talk to you more often. So again, uh, my name is Laurie Chen. Uh, I'm Chinese. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, I came to Canada about 30 years ago, and uh, so I went to school for many years, uh, learning all the, how the chemicals affect human health. So over the years, I've been doing research on the safety of country food, traditional food that you eat. So we did a lot of projects looking at how much food is important to the diet, to the, maintain the health of our people, and then how much is too much, you know, how, 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 uh, what is the impact of industry, et cetera, right? But in the last 10 years or so, we start to see that a lot of the issues is not related to the safety anymore. People just complain not having the fish at all. Uh, so it's the security. You know, how do we get enough food that they always like? That becomes a more critical challenge, right? And then the, the, the impact of climate change has become more and more apparent. We now see that you know, it's happening now. It's not just you know, 50 years later. So we need to look at, look at, at one, and also at one time, looking at the impact of industry, also at the other time, predicting what climate may change, and then organize ourselves to prepare what is the best way to protect the, the food, the, the, the berries, the fish, and everything that we want to uh, um, feed our children. Right? So um, this project started about three years ago. Uh, so um, we, when we actually think about doing a project on this topic, it is very complicated. It, is, it involves nutrition, it involves wildlife, it involves fisheries, and it's a global issue, not just here, right? So, so we put together a team of researchers and we identify four First Nations on the BC coast that are very good, very capable. Uh, and so we, we put this project is to work together. We call it co-develop strategies to uh, adapt for climate change, right? So the, the, the really important part of this project is that we work together. It's not that we come to do research and, and, and talk to you about results. No, it doesn't work like that. So we have to come all the time listen to what your, the stories that you tell us, and also uh, uh, keep you updated about what we find, and then we learn from all this information together and come up with some adaptation plan, right? So, um, so uh, we have three members here on our team. We also have uh, three other members online, and two others cannot make it. So I will let the people who are online to introduce themselves, uh, we start with uh, Dr. Malik Patel, uh, who is a professor at the University of Montreal uh, in 
Montreal, Quebec. Malik, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, thank you for hosting us today. We cannot turn our um, cameras on uh, for some reason, uh, but uh, you'll have my voice coming to you. Um, so as Laurie said, I'm at the University of Montreal. I am um, a nutrition and food security researcher. I'm interested in uh, the potential of traditional food, um, marine and otherwise, in uh, securing food security in promoting a better diet and i have had the pleasure to work in several communities uh, in british columbia but uh, not yet in your beautiful uh, community and i'm looking forward to working with the nation thank you and um, next is uh, william william are you there Yes, I am. Uh, hi, I'm William Chang. Uh, I am uh, uh, based at the University of British Columbia uh, at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. Uh, I have the uh, pleasure and honor to uh, visit uh, the uh, uh, community uh, uh, several times uh, because uh, we have been working with, uh, my, my, particularly through my uh, previous master's student, Patricia uh, um, Angewang, um, who work closely with uh, members of the communities uh, for her master projects. Uh, so the, uh, we, we had um, uh, co-organized uh, uh, two workshops uh, in the communities where we, uh, we, we met with uh, various uh, members. And, and uh, uh, so, so it's, it's, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, revisit it. Uh, that's uh, something that I really want to do uh, in the future. Um, uh, in the projects, um, I um, work on the uh, looking at uh, the linkages between climate change and uh, seafood availability and subsequently how that would then affect uh, the uh, the supply of seafood to uh, to to uh, to the communities uh, for food uh, I, I'm a marine ecologist and fishery scientist by training so uh, I uh, in the projects I'm really um, supporting that role in trying to build that um, scientific understanding as well as providing projections about uh, how the climate change will be affecting the um, seafood. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. And that's all, uh, uh, Tiffany. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, April, for organizing those videos. That was really great to watch, and it's nice to see everyone on, on camera. Um, my name is Tiffany Kenny. I was a PhD student with uh, Dr. Chan. And now I'm a professor in the Faculty of Medicine at Laval University. Hi, it's nice to see the, the crowd there. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, I had the, the pleasure and the privilege of visiting your beautiful community uh, twice. Now um, we had that great workshop that uh, William mentioned previously, but um, I guess a lot of my work has been in the Arctic and it's been on climate change and the, the climate change there is very, very dramatic. And I know it has been in BC uh, this past year as well. And so it's really looked at how um, climate change is impacting people's access to their traditional foods, but then also how things like um, the food that's available in the store, how expensive it, it is and how um, limited the choices can be. So looking at how all of those things interact and impact people's food security. So it's, it's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you, Tiffany. And then we also have uh, Dr. Anne Solomon from Simon Fraser University and uh, Dr. Terry uh, Sutherland from um, uh, UBC as well, who cannot make it tonight. Um, so the, the, uh, we, we all enjoyed the great feast that provided to us, you know, salmon and, and, and egg, it was fantastic. Uh, uh, and um, so the reason that we, we want you to come tonight is really to give you an update about what we have done so far uh, and also uh, uh, seek your advice on how to move forward you now in the next two or three years uh, what should we do uh, and, and, and get your advice to, to how to do a better job to get all the information together. Okay. So um, for uh, can you go uh, click on going forward? Yeah, perfect. So the, you have seen those videos showing the impact of climate change on the temperature of the river, of the ocean, and the change and affect the population of the fish, right? So um, Dr. William Jung at UBC is a world expert in this area. So he did an excellent job 
predicting uh, the impact of climate change in 17 different species of fish on the BC coast. Uh, and he found out that um, in the next uh, 20, 30 years, probably there's a de possible decline of fish population ranging from about 10% to 50%. So not all fish are affected the same. Uh, things like uh, herring, sea urchin, and salmon are the most affected. Uh, we're probably seeing like a 30% to 50% of decline in these fish. And we are, um, on, on the top end are sardines, clams, and crabs. They are the least affected. But still, they we see some possible decline of about 10% in those fish. So this is, um, and he also predicted that the change is not the same in all coastal communities. Uh, uh, the, the, the southern communities and the northern communities where we have different impact as well, right? Um, next slide. And some of you may remember, uh, uh, we did a study here called Food Nutrition and Environment Study back in 2008, 2009, right? So uh, uh, the, the results were very successful. We, we completed the same study uh, uh, with 92 First Nation communities from BC to the Atlantic region. Um, overall, in, in, uh, in BC, we have six coastal nations participating in the study. Uh, uh, Sleeman uh, was conducted in 2009. We had uh, uh, 83 uh, members from 83 houses participating in the study. It was uh, very good. Um, so in total, uh, we have over 7,000 people across the country participating in the study. So from the result of the study, we had a pretty good idea what food people use and how much. So what food is important in the diet of the people is now, now we have some idea, right? And we, one, the project was actually started to look at the impact of pollution. In the end, we found pollution was not that serious in most community. The food was generally okay. But then one, one uh, issue that we found was food security. Almost um, all across the country, about 50%, you know, every one in two people told us that they have some problems with getting food, uh, uh, sometimes not having food, in, not having enough food at all, going hungry. And sometimes, uh, a lot of times, they don't have food that they like. You know, they, a lot of traditional food they cannot have access to, right? So the, the, the percentage is really, really alarming. We thought BC is very good. Now, uh, you guys have so much resources, have, have, have uh, access to the sea, uh, marine food. The, you can look at BC communities. The food insecurity rate is also very high at 50%. And we, of the study, we also knew that many of the fish species that William predicted to be in decline are a very important part of the diet of the people. So if those fish are not available, of course, it will affect the, the culture because people will enjoy the fish. If they don't, are not available anymore, they can enjoy the fish. But also it will affect the health of the people because if those healthy fish are not available, the, the alternatives are usually not so good. People will buy cheap, non-nutritious food from the market, right? So it, it becomes a, a very critical issue that we can worry the impact of climate change on affecting the health of the people indirectly through the uh, affecting the, the, the quality of the diet because of the fish are not available, right? So um, that's why we, we obtained uh, funding uh, uh, next slide, uh, April. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, in, from the um, uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research uh, to support this uh, four year study working with uh, four BC First Coastal Nations uh, to uh, co develop uh, adaptation plans together. So the idea is that we will develop a plan for each of the nation. So for, for um, um, Sleeman, we will have a uh, collect information and develop a plan for Sleeman. So, and also for the other three communities. And then working with the First Nations Health Authority, we will also uh, share some of the learnings that we learn from the four participating communities 
with the other coastal communities and try to develop a more regional uh, strategy for protecting fisheries, marine fisheries, uh, for the um, traditional food system uh, for all the coastal First Nations. And eventually, we hope to share these results with all the other coastal indigenous communities in the world as well, because many people are facing similar issues. So the experience, the learning that we, we uh, develop from, from the four First Nations will be very valuable to be shared with all the other First Nations communities, right? So um, we started the project in 2018, and of course it got disrupted because of COVID. So in the last 18 months, we didn't do too much. Uh, and hopefully, you know, with COVID now somewhat under control, we hope that uh, 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 we can kickstart the meeting again. Um, so, so that's why we are doing a tour uh, uh, this fall, try to uh, visit all the communities. Uh, again, get your, uh, we engage you and let, let you know what we are doing and, 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 and agree to a, how, a method on how to move forward. Next slide. So um, the, the, in about all the four communities, um, uh, Suleiman has, has to have a head start uh, because you guys are so ready to go, I don't know, at the knees and so ready to, to start going. Um, so we had two students um, on, on the picture there. Some of you may re remember them, uh, Patricia and, uh, working with William and Sachi working with uh, Anne Solomon. Uh, and um, so they, they did uh, a series of workshops. So they invited knowledge holders in the communities to share with us their knowledge about what are the species of food, uh, uh, fish that is important to the communities, how people get them and how, how they are distributed and what are the barriers affecting them uh, and uh, how would they like to get more of them and then what happened, in the, uh, what was the, the important species in the past compared to what is the species that I consume now and why there was a change, right? So from the results of this workshop, next slide. Yeah, so uh, some of you may part have participated in this workshop. So um, the first one was in December, 2018. The second one was um, August 1st, 2019. So it was very interactive. So we, 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 we try to help the, the large shareholders to identify which component is important and what are the drivers which affects them, right? Next slide. Uh, and follow-up meetings again. So these are some of the pictures documenting how they are done. Next slide. So, uh, so the key question really is like how much and, and what type of fisheries change over the last decade? This slide. Yeah, and then the, the, the one of the key questions that we need to uh, answer is that if there are more fish or less fish that we can catch from the ocean, how is it affect the amount of fish people eat? Right? Because it's not going to affect everybody the same way. And people may respond to the decline of fish in different ways. Some people may make more effort in getting more. Some people cannot do that. Right? So we try to understand how people can get fish from the ocean. Some of them may be through sharing, some of them may be by communal harvest, et cetera. So those are the, the very unique Indian communities. So we need to understand that, right? Next slide. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, input from uh, uh, knowledge holders like Roy uh, told, told us a lot about fisheries. Next slide. And uh, finally, so that was uh, in August 2019, we had a big, uh, uh, again, a big feast, uh, um, talking about the results. Right. Next slide. Um, and the last summary report uh, was released in the, uh, February 2020, uh, showing uh, what, what was the observation and, and, and what, we, what did we find. Next slide. So based on those results, now we are ready to move to the next stage. Now we understand what fishes are important, how they're distributed. So we want to, to um, um, conduct similar studies in the other three communities. So they're, they're catching up to Sleeman. Uh, but then in Sleeman, we also want to start 
forming a more uh, formal structure for the project. Uh, as I said, the project is co-developed co together with, with the First Nations and the researchers. So we want to invite uh, uh, one elder or knowledge holder from each of the communities to be on our steering committee. So these are, they, they are the boss, so they tell us what to do, right? Uh, so we want to, to uh, we're asking uh, April and Denise to help us to invite, identify such a person and invite them to participate. So the, the, we hope that it will happen soon. Uh, and once we have that, then we will um, start look at all the, all the different methods that we use, make sure that they are okay. Next slide. So the next step in, in, in Sleeman is that we want to repeat the dietary study that we did 13 years ago, because it's, a, it's been a long time. And we heard that there are a lot of things have changed already, right? So um, in the last study we did was we invited uh, 100 houses uh, and one adult from each house to participate. So this time we want to repeat the studies by uh, also inviting 100 houses and representing from each house to participate. But we also want to know more about the diet of children and youth, right? So in each house, we want to invite uh, one adult and also one children from three to 17 years old. So basically the, the way we do it is we, we ask them, do you have children or youth three to 17 years old in your family? If yes, who's the birthday that comes next? Right? So if your eldest son's birthday is coming up next and he's 14, so then we will invite the son or the daughter to participate. If the next one coming up is three years old, then we will invite the three years old to participate. Right? So, so then we have a better understanding of what is the diet of the, ad, the, the adult is like in the family and what is the diet of the youth and children is like in the same family and how they are, are related. Right? Um, we also ask, uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at um, the reasons how if we see changes in the diet from in the last 13 years. So we want to understand why. Uh, and so the information that we collected in the workshops will become important, right? So those are the, the uh, can provide a lot of answers to us to understand why, right? So from those information, then we can actually start to think about possibility of what programs or plan, adaptation plan that we can implement uh, for um, security, securing uh, the important species of food in the communities. Right. So this afternoon, uh, we had a very good discussion with Denise and April, and we had lots of ideas. And hopefully, you know, based on the results of the study, we can strengthen those ideas and say, well, yeah, this, this really will be useful, that will be more important, et cetera. Right? So, um, so in the next two years, we will have a series of uh, uh, questionnaire interviews and also workshops, again, to, to get those information. And April, uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, I think the progress today we have to cover. Next steps is we need, we need to uh, um, uh, recruit some researchers locally, uh, and then we will work with April and Denise to train them, provide training, uh, make sure all the, all the uh, questionnaires are appropriate. You know, we, we ask the right questions. Um, and then we hoping to start the research in January 2022. Right. So from now till Christmas, we start all the planning, make sure that all the, all the uh, personnel are in place. So when we come back after Christmas, we can start the, the study. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, so the timeline is that, um, uh, as I said, um, in these two, three months, we will be forming the three committee, uh, developing the tools, um, and then from uh, um, winter 2022 to so basically January to April, May uh, next year, uh, we will do the interviews and the questionnaires. Uh, and then we'll come back in the fall, uh, so it's probably the same time next year, to look at the other results again. So check, check with you and say, this is what we found, does it make sense? Uh, is there something wrong? We need to, uh, to adjust them, etc. And then, uh, in uh, two years from now, 
we will wrap up the project, look at other results and, and present to you. This is the what we found. This is the plan that is co-developed together with the uh, relevant people in the community. How do we use this plan to move forward? Right. So that's the plan that will happen in the next two years. April. Yep. That's it. Yep. So this is something that we have in mind. Uh, um, the one thing that is really critical for the success of some uh, a project like this is your support, right? So because you know if you're not interested, then there will be no project. Uh, so you know all of you need to help us to champion for the project, let people know that this is important, ask them to participate, etc. Right? Denise. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> April, I forgot the people on the people on the screen are listening to. <clears throat> so that's why we want to do this work is just to make sure that we want to know from you what barriers you have to your harvesting. Why can't you get what you used to get anymore? And we talked today as well about the reality is not everybody has a boat anymore. Not everybody has a motor and a trailer anymore. A lot, you know, years ago, there were boats on the beach all over the place, but now, you know, maybe only one person in our family has a boat anymore, or people don't hunt anymore, because before you could go hunting and you didn't need the firearm license, right? You didn't need all those licenses. Now you do, so maybe that's why people aren't hunting anymore. But um, we need to look at all those um, challenges to why people aren't able to get the traditional foods they used to get anymore. So by doing this work and participating in this work, we'll be able to plan into the future. If things are gonna keep changing, then we have to change with it, right? Or, or we won't be able to get these things anymore. So that's why we partner with people like Dr. Chan and uh, Mary from First Nation Health Authority. You know, they're willing to help us do this work. They're willing to fund this work with us and partner with us. So I think it's really exciting. We've done the studies 13 years ago, that just blows my mind. <laughs> and we're doing it again this year. And when we talked today about it as well, I said, absolutely, there's going to be big differences in what we said 13 years ago. 13 years ago, life was a lot different. 
climate change wasn't as serious. We didn't have the heat dome. 13 years ago, we were still getting sockeye on our tables. So um, I think there's gonna, we're gonna find out a lot from participating this round. And it's something I think we need to just continue to do um, ongoing is just figuring out how do we adapt to this ch changing climate and how we still manage to stay being Kaimo, right? And exercising our rights and gathering in our territory. So I just wanted to kind of echo some of what Dr. Chan has said and, and just explain why we're gonna do the work we do. And I, I'm excited to see that the youth will be part of it this year, that young people will be part of it. Um, I'm curious to know how you ask a three-year-old those questions though. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Denise. Uh, no, I promise I won't do any surveys for the rest of the year, but come January, I might have to harass you guys again. So I do appreciate that. Um, I think we've got about 10, 15 minutes where we can take any questions, comments, concerns. If anyone has any ideas for next steps, now's a good time to go ahead, but it doesn't all have to be today. I'm always available if you wanna talk about it in the future. But for now, I believe we would like to say something. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank all the elders for being here. I think if it wasn't for them on the things I have to say, um, I wouldn't be saying these words. Looking at the videos is totally a tremendous uh, uh, memory of sitting with these elders back in the day, talking about like Agnes the fish and Elsie, the historical information on the Theodosia, and just so many stories. I was one of the fortunate ones growing up with aunties and uncles and grandpas that taught us the significance of traditional value and, and harvesting and gathering. Uh, the 13 moons we talked about, we were saying that 13 moons are changing every year and times to gather and harvest food are different because of climate change. It's totally true. I've grown up and lived and breathed fish and hunting and gathering and harvesting. And uh, every year it's changing because of the higher water temperatures and uh, the the sun so hot in the summer, killing off clam beds and some of our clam gardens we harvest in, in, in year after year are no longer there and they're no longer abundant. Looking at the studies that we're doing, I think it's a, a beautiful thing. I've worked with Sachi and Patricia in the last few years and uh, listened to what they had to say and I'm, I'm echoing it again. Um, we got to look back at traditional teachings. Traditional values are very important. We could talk about climate change and food security. Food security means to me, who is gonna go and get this food for the people in the community that can't get out and get it anymore. I think we need to take a step back and we need government's ears in our community to listen, to educate our youth through the school curriculum we have to, or do our own workshops here in the community to instill these teachings back into our kids again, so that they can learn what I learned as a fortunate child back in the day to, to be able to harvest and provide for their families. That's the big missing link here right now. I sat here last week and we at a residential school work, workshop and we talked about acknowledging all the people here that went to residential schools. The gym was full of our community. All those people there are displaced. They've lost their access to their traditional teachings and their access to traditional harvest. I think to start things off, we we want to start there and instill this into the youth especially our grandchildren so that they learn what i learned and you share the stories i always ask the kids when's the last time you went and visit your granny and your uncle and your auntie and talk to them about how it was back in the day and how they used to live and how they used to survive those stories are missing because we're not getting a chance to share them anymore elders that we see in the videos are gone they carried that knowledge with them if we don't share it, the kids aren't going to understand what climate change is and food security. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, don't be sorry. We appreciate your knowledge. Oh, you'll be sorry. Denise is going to kick me out after this. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, first, I just want to say I'm Sherry. I married into the community and raised 10 children here. So as culturally as I can and healthy as I can, which means eating traditionally, right? That's healthy and it's life skills, survival skills. Tradition is gonna get you through. Um, but one thing I've noticed, um, 
I don't know if it's going to keep happening this way, but you're talking about food security of being able to keep harvesting our wild foods and medicines. But there's another thing going on, not just with the trees getting sick, our animals are getting sick. I actually didn't harvest this year I did, but the last two years I got turned right off the deer. They're getting different sicknesses. One I could I found on the internet, one was nowhere and it was and came from Harwood and just weird stuff like, and this was predicted many, many years ago too, and I'm starting to see it happen, right? So that's an issue as, as long, as, uh, along with keeping everything else healthy is the things that we harvest traditionally. Uh, now this one, um, I'm just gonna put a bee in your bonnet and this where you might kick me out, but um, have any of you climate change experts, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm calling you right or whatever, but um, heard of, uh, the earth cycles of grand solar minimum and grand solar maximum. Is anybody familiar with that? The, the grand solar's uh, cycles? No? Ye Sorry? Um, if I may, uh, if, if I may like um, uh, provide a quick, 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 uh, uh, Quick um, Thank you. feedback to that. Uh, it's, it's one of the, um, I think that there has been um, uh, alternative uh, uh, view about climate change. Uh, and one, one proposal was that it is um, um, the, the, the changing climate that we are observing right now, like the increasing in temperature was driven by things like um, the um, the uh, changes in the um, the, uh, the the uh, the distance between the the, the sun and, and 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 the earth because of the uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the switching of 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 the uh, of the um, pair to recycle. But uh, there has been, I mean, uh, decades of scientific evidence that shows that that's not the cause of the observed climate change. So uh, I think this well established um, from the um, uh, and now uh, uh, accepted um, that is uh, the the observed uh, long term changes in, uh, in in temperature that we have been observing uh, primarily caused by um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and human activities uh, since uh, uh, a century or more ago. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, th this is the main understanding around the world and what they promote. Um, but I just want to put this out there for thought for people because it's not 100% gloom and doom. We're not going to stop global warming because we, we do have a natural cycle, which is a few decades. I'm not sure exactly how many that changes. So the grand solar maximum is what we just ended and that's the, the hot decades. And the grand solar minimum is just starting, which is the cooler decades. I think it was around 2015, they started documenting frost where there never was before, killing early crops. There's different documentations around the world, if you look it up, of uh, colder temperatures where there wasn't before, et cetera. And we're supposed to be going into this colder era. Um, this past summer heat dome, I need someone to explain a heat dome, because um, my biggest suspect is, um, just hear me out, <laughs> is that it was man-made, um, you know, the chemtrail thing. I've documented, I've photoed, I've videoed, I've watched them turn into square clouds. I've watched them cover up black lines with white lines. And they were busy, very busy this past spring. And then, I don't know, here comes this hottest day ever when we're supposed to be in the minimum. You know what I mean? So um, that's my thought there. And uh, with the sockeye, I wanted to mention that um, I'm very hopeful of them returning right now because to my understanding, the main thing that stopped our run in particular, because other, other uh, areas are still have had their runs, um, is the fish farms, the Norwegian fish farms that finally got dismantled north of us were literally killing our run when the fish were babies. I don't know if you're, anyone's familiar with Alexandria Morton. She's been fighting for the salmon for many years. She went up there this spring to see for her own eyes that yes, the first time in many, many years, the baby sockeye are lice free. So that sounds really um, hopeful. And what was the other one? Darn it, I knew I'd forget something, but <laughs> you probably don't wanna hear from me anymore anyway, it's okay. <laughs> it was a good one though, Hoval. Well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Thanks, Sherry. Uh, anybody else want to say or add anything? Oh, we got our youth. I'm very happy to see all the elders here tonight and especially happy to have a youth as well. So thank you, Takaya. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Up to you. Hello, I'm Takaya. I'm here with my Chichi and Kupa, Bob and Elizabeth. Um, I've been thinking a lot about climate preparedness in our nation and food security. A friend of mine who's from the Skapa band of the Inklakatmok nation has been uh, trying to meet the needs of her community in the face of forest fire and a forest fire season created by climate change and then accelerated by industry's use of their territory. She had a home in Lytton that burned down in the summer. And I know some members of our nation, my cousin, have been involved in the fight against those fires in the interior this summer too. So there's that connection as well. But as soon as her home burnt down, she ran to the band office in the Scuppa band and was like, you know, we need to open this place up. People are going to come. And it wasn't just their people that went to that band office, but it was the, the Mamafa settlers of Lytton who were displaced from the fire. And it took, it took a while for adequate government services to arrive to take care of those people. So not only were the, the indigenous nation neglected, but also those settlers who were occupying their land who were displaced by the fire. And the nation was caring for these people. And I've been, I've been thinking about that story and it sat with me um, because in that territory, they've been experiencing the reality of a climate crisis this entire summer. But how long until that happens here? How long until we have to deal with forest fires? How long until there's a period of time in which we don't have enough food, we don't have enough um, resources and services, and we know as Indigenous people that we are not always a priority of the government. So I'm glad that this work is being done and it's something that I've thought about a lot. Um, and I was wondering what, um, what the intentions were to include youth, but also not only include, but um, have, have this research be kind of, you know, directed from within our community because these sites that are being talked about, like I, I feel like I don't have a strong relationship to those sites that others and older generations do. Um, and also, if in this study, you're going to be um, trying to assess the environmental damage being done by specific industry in our territory. Um, because I see that as, you know, in the conversation of food security, like that's, that's food being stolen from us. If we need food and there's a shortage of food, we're not having enough salmon to feed ourselves in these seasons, like, then every single industry that is impacting those populations is stealing food from us. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that's going to be studied, I guess, as part of this. Sorry, that was a bit long, but thank you. Ema, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, did you, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to get him to answer and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the, the voice of the youth is the most powerful uh, because you guys will be, is the future, right? Uh, so we are working hard to protect your future. But yeah, so um, two things. I think um, climate change is a major impact happening 
right? On top of that, there are urbanization, industrialization, pollution, over exploitation of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think we, we, we are looking at the whole picture. Uh, as, um, um, that's why we really enjoy working with First Nations because you always look at the holistic view of the relationship between man and the land. Right? So um, uh, we are not going to away and say, well, we just look at this, but, but in, in the context of the climate change and environmental pollution, et cetera, how do we make decisions on measures or programs or using resources to protect the health of the people? I think that really is something that we try to use the research results to help people like Denise and, and April and, and, and the leadership in statement to do a better job in helping the people. And then also working with the relative uh, um, authorities like FNHA and Health Canada or the different government departments to champion for the collective support, right? And then internationally as well, we, 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 all the information that we obtain from each individual, we will form a bigger voice to make the changes, right? So like William is sitting on the international panel for climate change. So they, they will bring these results in the discussion table and use these results to champion for the, the need of the control. Right? And it may sound difficult, but, but we have done similar work before. We have done work on persistent organic pollutants in Stockholm Convention. We have done for mercury. Now we have a Minamata Convention. So the international community do listen. If we present enough evidence that this problem is real, we need to do something to make sure that it's not going to affect the livelihood of people. If there's enough evidence, people will change their mind and do something different, right? So I think we, ne we never know where, where the tipping point is. So each voice is very important. And, and our job is collect all the voices and make sure that we present the, all the evidence clearly, strongly, using the best method, so that there's no if and buts. But this is how it is. Right. So, yep. <laughs> so the answer is yes. Uh, we were actually just discussing that today about how the traditional knowledge holders are very slim compared to decades ago, and that we need to. It's like revitalizing the language that they're doing right now. We also need to revitalize the traditional teachings that we have and put it down to our youth so then they can bring it down to their children and so forth because we need to keep it alive right especially now with the climate change and everything that's happening we need to make sure that our children and their children are okay right so yes we will be doing that yes there is room on the steering committee for a youth representative because the more voices we have, the better it'll be. So um, once we get all that together, which will be the next steps in the next month or so, there will likely be a notice put out and applications or recommendations will move forward. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well done. Here. Hi. I'm still Flo George. <laughs> Um, just a little bit of history about the hatchery. We started the hatchery in April 1977. And um, because the salmon stocks were declining, we worked with Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, we did a lot of um, reconnaissance on the streams, local streams, to find out what actually was in the streams. And salmon is mainly uh, chum salmon. That's the main uh, chum river. It's got 80% chum, 10% coho, 5% pinks, and 5% chinook. And there's a lot of misconception about the sockeye. The sockeye was brought in by the other department that works at the hatchery, which is the Aboriginal Fisher Strategy. There's two departments at the hatchery. There's a provincial and a federal. The um, salmon enhancement program is federal. The uh, food fish, salmon, um, what's called? Aboriginal Fisher Strategy is provincial. And the Aboriginal Fisher Strategy was one that was providing the food for the, uh, for the community. 
there's a lot of arrangements that were being made. They had to get a sailing boat. They had to go out there and catch the fish. They had to have to get permits before. Then they distributed to the community they were per capita or per house or per person, depending on what they caught and if they got the permit to go out and get fish. So you always hear every year, everybody saying, what happened to our sake? What happened to our fish? And Kevin, Kevin Timothy used to work out there. Phil Gallagher was down the end. He worked there. He was the original guy that worked for Aboriginal Fishing Strategy. It takes a lot of money. They have to actually buy the fish. They don't, they don't get it for free. They have to pay the workers and everything to chain boats. So just in case you're wondering how come what happened to the sockeye? Sockeye doesn't come into Slyman Creek. All the time I worked there for 33 years, I seen one sockeye. So um, that's a misconception that everybody says, you know, the sockeye is returning to Slyman Creek. Slyman Creek is not a sockeye creek, it's a chum creek. Chum salmon. So just in case you're wondering, maybe if we're lucky enough that there's a big run of uh, sockeye next year or whatever, we can get some sockeye for food fish. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of your time. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes left. Does anyone else have any questions, comments, concerns? They migrate to the and the bigger streams, and uh, and they no you got they the each fish has a a route where they return to their home streams, like the chum salmon here they they migrate up uh, go to the Gulf of Alaska, and that's where they do their growth like three years, and when they're returning they get intercepted by the uh, foreign fishermen like the uh, the Japanese and the Russians at the two hundred mile limit. And that was just on somebody here just a while ago. Somebody decides to open up the Johnson Straits. They catch 10,000 fish. There's our fish, it's gone. You know, one set, then our fish are gone. So we get a low return. But sockeye do come by here. They, they come on the other side of Texada. They're going right, they're going right through. Yeah, you'd, you'd have the odd one that might get lost and wondering. That's how I seen one fish myself. You can really tell the the green and the red coloring. And that's how you've seen one fish down there. One, I've probably seen more, but it's, I, I, I remember seeing one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, Denise. Um, I just wanted to answer Sherry's question or just add to that. Um, we did a study on Powell Lake quite a few years ago to see whether or not we could reintroduce sockeye to Powell Lake because we do suspect that there was sockeye there at one time long before the dam. Um, so there was a study done on that. And then recently we've been doing one on Unwin Lake. Unwin Lake is just a little bit further up the coast um, in the Theodosia area, Theodosia Forbes Bay. And we're working, Kathy Gallagher started a project there. There's a lake there that has, uh, it had a small river and the river was dammed for logging back in the day. And so right now there's a study going on to, to see one, if those fish in the lake are landlocked sockeye. And then also to see if it's if it's viable to open up that old riverbed so that the sockeye can start returning again. So the nation, Kathy Gallagher has applied for some funding for that. And I think this is the second year of um, they're in there doing all kinds of science and testing to see if those are actually sockeye. And then the next phase would be to try to open up that channel and then see if that's sockeye, that creates a sockeye return. So literally trying to grow our own sockeye and get a terminal run happening in the territory again. So there is some work happening in that area. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Denise. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, I wanted to mention about the CO River, about the um, when you guys let more water in, one, is it once a year kind of thing? From, you, you allow more water down? I didn't quite get that. The, the water that's diverted. You guys open it up a bit and let more water down the Seal River. That's how it works. Uh, <laughs> so the dam. Uh, Sherry's asking about letting more water back into the Theodosia River. So the river was dammed, and there is a diversion, and the diversion is controlled. So um, we don't control the diversion; it's controlled by the dam owner. 
Yeah. I was understanding by the video that uh, when it's when it's spawn time that they let a little bit more down yeah. our river. Yeah, that's what I heard. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and I just wanted to um, comment on that was that because they mentioned the amount of water that they're going to let through is for the spawning. But um, I just wanted to mention that when that river was undammed, it it uh, helped the whole inlet, right? It needs that water flow for the whole all of Oak River Inlet, not just for the salmon going up the river. I wanted to mention that to whoever's um, involved in that. Thanks, yeah. Sherry. And, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get home sometime tonight. <laughs> Theodosia. Theodosia is one of our most pristine rivers for harvesting and gathering the different tastes of fish, like Elsie had mentioned earlier. We're fortunate we have one of the unique river systems there where we have a return of summer run chum there every year. Uh, we have snorkelers going to that con fish through there every other week to determine what the abundances are there. And we're finding right now the summer runs are have finished returning and they're done and the winters are starting to come so there's two unique summer two different species of fish there that come in at different times of the year and uh, it was one of the first places we harvested and gathered fish because of the summer runs back in the day then we come back to slam and the last place the fish would actually go up the river would be oak over and uh, so our people went from camp to camp and harvested fish in these different rivers at different times so we were always conservationists back in the day where we couldn't harvest in different areas and not overfish Salaman or Oak over or Theodosia. But our fight was when the dam was put in in the early 50s in the Theodosia to divert water into Paul Lake to generate hydropower. Uh, we talked about that, we saw in the video, there were 40 to 50,000 strong returning annually, the dominant species being chum. And uh, our focal point as a nation was what are we gonna to do to get those fish back? After the, so many years of the dam being in place, that 40 to 50,000 fish diminished to 6,000 fish returning annually, which was an eye opener for us here. So through an adaptive water management plan committee, working with the guys like uh, Mark Angelo and the biology just off through the Living Rivers program, we strategized on uh, doing something for the river. And, uh, through our negotiations to the Theodosia Roundtable uh, back in the day, we negotiated with uh, the power company back in the day was McMillan Bodell. It's changed to Sikorsky, it's changed to Brookfield, it's changed to Evolution over the years. to put some of that water back. So they asked, how much water do you need? Well, how much water we need to sustain those numbers back up to where they were to 40, 50,000 strong at one time. So we came with the, to an agreement that we were gonna put in an additional four and a half cubic meters of water more per second would give us at least half of those stocks to return back at around 25 to 27,000 fish. That negotiation has taken place. Uh, there's been new culvert bypass that was put in and uh, that's sublime the, the, the water we need to create that habitat for those fish. So the numbers are coming up. That's good to see. So Theodosia has always been my focal point. I just go up and I walk up there every two weeks just to go and have a look around and get a feel for what's happening. Eyes and ears are on the ground are, are crucial, uh, especially where we are with self-governance and where we're going to go with the things that were happening today with, with climate change. I see the changes up there. We have a groundwater channel up there nobody knows about. What this groundwater channel is, is a safe haven for fish to go when the river is flooding. It's a 500 meter made groundwater channel where it's uh, the influence of gravity fed water keeps the water flowing through there. On a flood stage, the fish go into these channels and uh, they spawn in there uh, with the, the calmer water, we get better survival rates in there. But also it's a beautiful haven for overwintering coho where the fish spawn, they'll stay in the system for and, and migrate out the following spring. They go into these channels and they stay in there and we get better survival rates. Uh, with the higher nutrient deposits off to those side channels. So it's something that we've been working on and uh, we need to look at it and uh, and start paying a little bit more attention to that river and its, and its, and its abilities to feed our community. Through treaty over the years and uh, self-governance and development a marine plan, we have uh, a quota that we're allowed to take from each river system based on a percentage on annual returns is the reason why we have snorkelers up in the Theodosia counting all the different species that are there. And uh, we do the same thing with Oak Over and Slam and 
So the numbers that we have in these river systems are going to be our food security for the nation. So the more we put in at the end of the day, we'll benefit in the long run by having more fish returning. Thanks, Lee. That's awesome. Anyone else? So thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, I'm really happy to see the amount of people that came today. This to me is a success. I had a maximum of 50. We had enough food for 50 people and then uh, we bit their 32. So, so thank you it was a great everyone night. for coming out tonight. I really want to do a shout out to Tim Paul and Lori Dingwell for doing the food. They're long gone. They were here all day. With that said, I failed in the planning of having dessert, so I apologize. Instead, you guys got a lot of videos. But thank you very much for coming out, our IT people for helping us, our people online, and all our traditional knowledge holders. We really appreciate you, and we look forward to meeting up with you guys again. If anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, you can contact me any day of the week at the band office. Thank you. <laughs>